It's good to uh, be here. It's good to see you all. Let me um, first uh, and foremost thank uh, Lynette, uh, Beery, and uh, uh, Nina Sassy in particular uh, for all their uh, kindness and uh, help um, and a little bit of finagling uh, during uh, the organization of this. I'm uh, uh, grateful and uh, humbled and honored uh, uh, to be here in front of uh, uh, an important group of folks like you all. I'd also like to thank the members of the um, a Maternal Infant Strategy Group for their commitment and expertise. I'm a newcomer to that team and uh, um, am really grateful to be part of it. Uh, and uh, I'm always, always, always happy to be around folks who are interested uh, in how we care for mothers babies, children, and families. So all in all, besides the fact that I'm watching you eat lunch while I'm not, <laughs> I'm a pediatrician. We have to whine a little bit. I am just as happy as I can be. Um, Pregnant pause while he figures out the electronics. Am I pointing or am I uh, advancing on a laptop? It is advancing, okay. Amazing that that actually works. Okay, so um, I have no conflicts of interest or disclosures. Um, however, um, I do have one revelation. Uh, I am a pediatrician. Uh, I am not an obstetrician, gynecologist, um, nor an expert on maternal mortality. Um, my talk, therefore, is going to focus uh, primarily on infant mortality. However, another revelation, uh, maternal and infant mortality are inextricably interconnected. Risk factors for babies, of course, are their mother's risk factors. Limited access to quality health care impacts both baby and mama. So um, if there are any potential haters out there, I am not intentionally ignoring mamas. <laughs> so, <laughs> does somebody have a seizure over there? Um, yeah, so um, uh, the, uh, object objectives here you can uh, see for yourself, uh, going to uh, discuss uh, uh, some of my lessons learned over the course of my uh, career. Um, you'll figure out shortly, for those of you who did, did not know the graduate from medical school in 1976 arithmetic, that I am old. Um, uh, going to discuss uh, the importance of collaboration and uh, an integrated approach to maternal and infant mortality by clinical medicine, public health, community partners, and the community itself, importantly. Uh, talk about uh, a few initiatives if we get time. Discuss the role of race and racism and uh, introduce the governor. Uh, and, uh, whoa, did he throw in race and racism? Oh, I guess he did. Um, my real objectives, on the other hand, um, are to inspire and encourage, not that the other objectives are not important, uh, but uh, particularly as a key keynote speaker at lunchtime, I think the goal really is more to inspire you to get up and go running, screaming, out the door, charge, uh, to tackle more problems and to uh, be re-energized. Uh, there'll be a little bit of information here, but I suspect uh, um, there won't be much in the way of surprises. Uh, to challenge you, um, perhaps be provocative, perhaps make you uncomfortable, um, and to be as supportive as I possibly can. So. Uh, this slide you've seen uh, before. Um, I'm not going to repeat the story of my dad, although I suspect uh, a few of you got here after I told it, but um, the, the, the short version is that my dad, who could not practice in majority hospitals in Detroit, in one generation, his son was a president of one of those hospitals. Um, and that is... <laughs> that is an American success story. That is a very typical American success story, and those kind of stories don't happen in very many places. And so, certainly if we think that uh, there's been no progress made, that is uh, not my perspective. In uh, 1980, um, after uh, training at the Children's Hospital of Michigan, I started uh, in private practice. I was always interested in um, 
uh, public health sort of sort of stuff, um, uh, population health kind of things. Um, when that term wasn't coined yet, I don't think, um, especially issues of underserved populations. Um, and I got interested in sudden infant death syndrome and infant mortality um, because I had uh, someone in my practice who had had uh, deaths, um, and deaths multiple, um, in their family from SIDS, and uh, we were all just sort of mystified by it. Um, didn't really know much about SIDS at that time, don't know much about it now. Um, and I somehow or another became a statewide and national expert uh, on something that nobody understood. And I've already told you how impressed my youngest daughter was with that. Um, you know, we were doing sleep studies, two-channel, three-channel studies um, on babies uh, called pneumograms, uh, monitoring babies who had abnormal test results with the uh, uh, misconception, um, in retrospect, uh, that we would be able to identify which babies were at risk for sudden unexpected death. So there were lots of successes and failures in many respects, um, but I had lots of conversations with families trying to explain risk factors to people whose babies had died. Um, and they would say things like, well, my sister smoked during pregnancy, too, and her baby is perfectly fine. Um, you know, the most difficult answer to the question was, well, Dr. Gray, I did everything right, and my baby died. Why? So these conversations as precursors to the terminology, nomenclature, social determinants of health, and, you know, there was great impetus at that time, even though the science wasn't very good, to do something. The infant mortality rate in the city of Detroit and southeast Michigan was horrendous, worse than uh, many third world countries. Can't you do something? Um, and so we sort of fell into that, um, I wouldn't say trap, but we felt uh, motivated to try something, to do something, and monitors seem to be a relatively harmless thing besides the fact that they chirp all night and make you crazy. Um, and then in, on June 21st, 1994, I remember, because that's my birthday, um, and I turned 12 on, on that day, um, <clears throat> uh, I was at the National Institutes of Health um, as one of the SIDS experts who were introduced to the Back to Sleep campaign. Um, and the universal response by the experts in the room early in the morning was, that can't possibly work. That's stupid. Babies are going to be aspirating all over America. Um, and of course, it did work, and they brought in one expert after another from Norway, from Sweden, from Australia, from New Zealand, from England. Um, and by the end of the two-day conference, it was indisputable that there was something there. Um, and indeed, there was. Um, and um, I lived through the time that uh, infant and child death review panels came into being. And, uh, you know, and, and my wife uh, was on one of those panels, or maybe a couple of those panels, state level and county level. And we learned so much about where children were living, what the, their sleeping environments were like, what the real world was compared to our idealized version of what the real world was. Um, and so reading reports of baby found dead, um, uh, laying face down in foam rubber mattresses, um, on sofas, um, having been overlain by a parent um, during a deep sleep, um, or a parent who was impaired in some way. Um, you know, crib slats that were too wide, um, and they got their heads stuck between the slats, um, or they fell down between the mattress and the wall. Um, and suffocated, um, and it was, the data was all there in front of us, and no one had ever really suspected that. Um, and um, it, it was just remarkable to me that we were seeing this kind of thing in a country like America. And so sudden infant death syndrome, sudden unexpected death in babies, and infant mortality was where I spent a big part of my early career. Um, and so today, in some respects, it's sort of like a full circle kind of kind of moment for me. Um, not quite as powerful as uh, my jump, jumping Javon experience, but certainly a full circle experience. The primary causes of uh, infant mortality uh, have really remained unchanged over a long period of time. Birth defects, uh, premature birth uh, or low birth weight, 
um, and uh, sudden unexpected death or sudden infant death syndrome. Um, and there's been modest understanding in understanding um, how we might impact birth defects, um, but very modest. Advances in genetics and genomics is promising and will probably help us uh, more in that respect. Um, uh, a much expanded newborn screening program identifies a few disorders that can cause sudden unexpected death. Um, uh, neural tube defects, we know that if you, you know, give folate uh, during pregnancy, um, you, you reduce the risk considerably. Uh, prematurity remains a major issue still. Um, uh, certainly, uh, the person who's uh, on her way to the airport now has, you know, done some, uh, you know, landmark work in that, uh, groundbreaking work, um, Dr. Sonia Hassan in the perinatal research branch at, in Detroit. And there have been a, a, some advances um, in reducing uh, the incidence of SIDS, uh, primarily uh, through the Back to Sleep campaign. So, some things uh, remain the same. How have we done? So in the next uh, few minutes, I'd like to just uh, review how we've done as a state um, in the period that I have been a practicing uh, physician, 1980 uh, through today. So this first slide, I'm, I'm disoriented because I, I can see the slide from a distance, but I can't read it, so you'll have to trust me, because um, <laughs> uh, I'm just going to make something up. Um, and my little laptop isn't showing the same thing that I'm, that I'm looking at. Um, the, um, there was a lot of progress made um, from the 80s through the early 2000s. Um, and this is the overall trend for the state of Michigan. This is the trend uh, uh, separated out by race. Um, and so you have uh, in the orange color there, you have blacks, you have whites in the blue color there. Why those aren't black or white, I don't know. But um, And then you have a... a you know, a, a ratio up top that shows the disparity. And so you can see that uh, uh, from two and a half to, two to two and a half, uh, up to three times uh, the death rate for black babies compared to white babies uh, between 1980 and 2017. Um, and uh, um, the, the third uh, slide here um, shows um, uh, the city of Detroit in comparison. Um, in some ways, uh, b because of such a dominantly uh, uh, African-American uh, community, um, it mimics or mirrors uh, the, uh, the previous slide. I I'd uh, be remiss if I didn't uh, thank uh, uh, Nina for getting these slides for me. Um, and they, of course, come from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services Division of Vital Records and Health Statistics. And uh, looking at all of those slides, one would see in the last 10 years or so, we've been really pretty stagnant, um, you know, virtually flat. Um, uh, some may optimistically say, oh, there's a slight improvement. Well, well it may be a slight improvement, but it ain't much of an improvement. Um, and so we have uh, significant work uh, to be done there in uh, infant mortality. We um, always, you have to show a cute mommy baby picture during any presentation. So observe that while I flip my pages. Prematurity is the most significant cause of uh, infant mortality. And uh, we have a couple of ways to demonstrate that. And uh, this is, uh, again, uh, the time period is a little bit different uh, uh, for technical reasons, 1990 through 2017. Um, and you see the trend line for a preterm births. Again, not really doing a whole lot here. Um, uh, this one has been a really tough nut to crack. Uh, when you uh, separate out for the races, again, uh, you see in the gold, uh, the uh, African-American babies, and in the blue or light blue there, uh, uh, the white babies. And again, while the disparity is not as great, um, you know, two to two and a half, um, it's still a significant disparity. Um, and, uh, um, and in 2017, I don't know if you can see it, but the rate is 10.2%, uh, um, which is uh, above our national um, average, or national rate of 9.93%. Uh, and so uh, lots of work to be done um, in preterm births as well, which is, you know, intuitively makes a lot of sense given that um, 
uh, prematurity is the major, one of the major causes of infant mortality. So, yes, 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 we have made reasonably good progress, and it would be wrong to characterize it as anything but that over the last several decades. Uh, however, in the last 10 years or so, in spite of the efforts of many, uh, and many sitting in this room, and myself included, the racial gap is basically unchanged. There's no denying that. There's no denying what the data shows us and tells us. Race is an issue. Why is that? Well, this is really, I heard the term earlier today, I think it was attributed to uh, Lynette. Um, this is heavy lifting. This is hard, hard work. This is very difficult work. And given that you know, I've been involved in this, and there's folks in this room who've been involved longer than I have, um, it could be easy to get discouraged, particularly with the results of the last uh, decade or so. The thing that would be even worse than getting tired or discouraged of course, would be to become cynical. This is heavy lifting, um, and uh, anyone new to this uh, area of work shouldn't be um, disabused of the notion that it's going to be hard for you. You're going to have to work your tail off. You're going to have su some successes and plenty of failures. We know that we have in this country uh, a challenge with racial disparities. Virtually all of the health indicators, whatever it is, virtually all of the health indicators that we measure have a racial disparity, including infant and, more, and uh, maternal mortality. We know that being black particularly increases the risk of infant death. Black babies die disproportionately more than white babies. Being born black, just being born black, is a social determinant of health. That's really pretty astounding. Now we know that black, brown, yellow, white human beings are virtually indistinguishable from each other genetically and biologically. Differences in skin color, hair, texture, eye color, are simply geographic adaptations to where that race sort of found themselves, be it Europe, Africa, or elsewhere. Race, therefore, like gender, is a social construct. It is not genetic. It is a social construct. We define what it means. Race is not our problem. Race is not our problem. Racism is our problem. Some call it America's original sin. Well, America's been struggling mightily with her sin. Um, and uh, lots of progress certainly has been made. You know, my family's story is, um, you know, indicative of that. It's the classic American success story. And so, clearly, we are making progress. Uh, but just as clearly, there is so much more that must happen before we can eliminate what, why some people are more at risk for health problems or even death simply because of their race. In America, people die simply because of their race. So. I have to say that, that uh, sometimes I do get tired of looking at the data that we just shared. Um, it's exhausting. It's emotionally exhausting. I get bone tired from it. Um, I get weary from it. There's an old Negro spiritual derived from slavery that is still sung in churches across America. We see here the cover of sheet music for this song that was cataloged in the Library of Congress in 1877. 
children don't get weary. You can see on the cover, if you can read that far, plantation song and chorus, sung with great success by all the minstrels. Children don't get weary. Children don't get weary. Children don't get weary till your work is done. Working from sunup to sundown, the slaves had many ways to encourage each other, to press on, to not give up. I'm sure that this song isn't just about working the fields or any other physical labor. It's about the hopes, the deferred dreams, the efforts to survive from one day to the next, the prayers for a better life of freedom for their children. I can easily relate to this song. Indeed, I sing this song in choir. We had that conversation. Uh, I'm weary. I'm weary. I'm weary of wondering why it's so hard to convince some that addressing racism and racial disparities is a legitimate discussion for healthcare professionals. I'm weary wondering, you know, why we avoid critical conversations. I'm weary why we don't have critical conversations. I'm weary of black and brown babies dying more than anyone else. And I'm weary of the lack of national outrage. Why is nobody storming you know, the, the castle? You know, why is this just OK? It should not ever, ever, ever be OK. Children don't get weary, children don't get weary, children don't get weary till your work is done. I believe infant and maternal mortality is not exclusively a medical condition. It is a social condition masquerading as a medical condition. And we must treat it accordingly. It's not that the science isn't important. I'm a doctor. It's not that the medicine isn't important. It's not that the, the length of the cervix isn't important. It's not that premature delivery isn't important but it's far more complicated than that. And if we wonder why we have plateaued, certainly one, I believe, logical explanation is because we've gotten to the point where all the science has done us as much good as it can do, and we can probably get a little bit more out of that. But fundamentally, there's something systemically wrong with the world that we live in, systemically. The um, comic and uh, night show host, John Stewart, <laughs> believe it or not, I'm quoting him, <laughs> said that if racism is something you're sick and tired of hearing about, imagine how exhausting it must be living it every day. And James Baldwin, noted author, poet, intellectual, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. If we are afraid to have critical conversations as healthcare professionals whose lives are devoted to caring for other humans, if we're afraid to have those tough conversations uh, about racism uh, in the world that we live in, who is going to lead this conversation? It should be us. It is not a state responsibility, it's not government's responsibility, it is our collective responsibility. Mark Twain, another noted philosopher, said that denial is not just a river in Egypt. For those of you who are a little slow, I'll say it one more time. 
denial is not just a river in Egypt. Denial is also not an acceptable response to a critical public health issue. Not acceptable. No matter how much we want to stick our heads in the sand and pretend that everything's okay, it is not. And we have work to do, all of us. Racism is an important issue. It's an important public health issue. It's an important social issue. I believe that many of the social determinants of health are primarily a product of racism. Not just a sort of incidental, they're primarily a product of racism. And this really is not about you as an individual. This is not about you personally. Um, you know, so the vast majority of us um, in this room gathered here today um, are good people trying to do their best to provide outstanding care to those they serve. I know that. I see that every day. Um, I'm part of it. I recognize it. But what's clear to me as well is that poverty, access to health care, the quality of the health care you receive, are all heavily influenced by racism. Even in spite of the efforts of well-meaning, good people. So this is one of these conversations or discussions, or actually I guess it's a monologue, um, of, you know, and you have to eat and so you're forced to listen. <laughs> so there, there, there's, there's a difference uh, between racism and you know, racism is systemic. Let's show the slide. So firstly, prejudice. Prejudice is, it occurs when you prejudge others based on their social group. Discrimination occurs when action is taken to back up that prejudice. For example, threats and violence, the Ku Klux Klan as an example. But racism is a defined as a structure or a system that is supported by institutional, legal, and social power. This comes from the book that uh, Lynette shared with me, right, White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism by Robin DiAngelo. Would encourage you to read it. Interesting, you know, not too hard of a read, um, except that it makes you as uncomfortable as all get out. The quick response, and she talks about this in more detail, the quick response by many of us when confronted with you know, a racism discussion um, is maybe to eat lunch really fast and get up and go to the bathroom, um, or to become defensive, or to get mad, or to just stop talking about it, um, I, la, 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 la. Um, or to make comments like, I don't have a racist bone in my body, slavery's been over for 150 years, I'm leaving, I'm not going to listen to that. And the infamous, some of my best friends are. We saw that play out on national television just a week and a half ago, um, you know, when you know, one of our uh, you know, national representatives um, brought out a black person to demonstrate that there's no racism involved in what they were talking about. Um, completely tone deaf. So, Racism is not about you as an individual as much as it is about the system we live in that allows one group of people to benefit over another group of people. So please reflect on these definitions. Please reflect on your implicit bias. We all have it. It's not even a question of whether you have it. We all have it. It's just different for each one of us what it is. Um, but all people um, you know, have this and, and struggle with this. Reflect on it. Get the book. Understand more about racism and its systemic effects. You will be a better care provider as a result of it. Racism is an important issue. It's important to note now, because I've, I've also heard the response of, uh, well, you know, black people are prejudiced too. Um, black people can be racist too. Well, black people are prejudiced too. Um, black people are, you know, all people are prejudiced too. All, you know, they discriminate as well. Um, you know, there is no perfect 
human being um, you know, amongst us, uh, black, brown, yellow, whatever. Uh, however, though people of color may be prejudiced against whites, they do not have the means, laws, and policies to implement their discrimination throughout society. In the United States, white people control all the instruments of power, and therefore, only they can exercise racial privilege over other races. And so I would ask you to reflect upon that as well, because one of the implications of that, of course, is that it's not going to be black people that help us figure out how to address racism. We can be encouraging, we can be supportive, we can, it's in our self-interest. Um, however, those in a position of privilege have to address it um, by discussing this with each other, by praying over it, by reflecting over it, by considering uh, that the guy standing at the podium, um, bald-headed, gray-haired, old, um, is not crazy um, and would not have even dreamed of giving this same talk 20 years ago um, because of all kinds of reasons, um, including what the heck would happen to my career. Well, now I'm old. And the one thing that I can assure you that I know is going to happen at the end of this talk is that my wife is going to say, if you say you're old one more time, I'm going to kill you. I can see it on her face. So if racism is indeed this huge challenge to us and uh, is a public health issue, a biomedical model is insufficient to deal with the core challenges of maternal and infant mortality. And again, don't get it twisted here. That does not mean that we don't work on the biomedical stuff. Clearly, that's important. However, it is insufficient. Our goal of zero preventable deaths, zero disparities in babies and mothers will not be accomplished with the biomedical model only. The medical model will be very important, very important but the challenge is much greater than what healthcare professionals alone can accomplish. And so it's important that we work together across many sectors, many of whom are represented here today, uh, some of whom are not. The medical community, the public health community, the social services community, churches and other religious, religious organizations, communities themselves, we must all work together because it really does take a village. I heard Dr. Sokol earlier today in the introduction say it takes a state. It takes a, a, a big uh, village uh, to address this. So we need each other. You know, if you look at this slide, poverty, social isolation, restricted access to health care, hunger, food insecurity, literacy, stressful home environments, homelessness, implicit or unconscious bias, adverse childhood experiences. Which one of these things on this list are things that the healthcare delivery system is expert at? Which ones? These are what we, some of the factors that we describe as social determinants of health and probably the least informed people uh, about these things are the healthcare delivery system. We tend to be, you know, people who have had uh, charmed backgrounds, uh, middle class backgrounds, uh, upper class backgrounds. We get into medical school, we get into nursing school, we do our thing. So the list of conditions are all issues that can be considered social determinants of health, particularly for infants and mothers, and we don't have the right people together at the table working consistently in a way that is effective. For most of us that have been doing this work for any period of time, this isn't really a new message. It's not surprising to hear that we need to work together collaboratively. Currently, there's lots of organizations across many sectors focused on infant and maternal mortality. But why is the needle moving so slowly? Consider and reflect on these questions. Are our efforts well coordinated across those sectors? Do we communicate effectively across those sectors? 
Do we measure our success and rewards collectively or similarly? Or does what rewards the, the human services folks is a different reward for those who are in healthcare, is a different reward from you know, people who work towards what they are rewarded for, whether it's academic success or money or whatever it is? How well do we work together? Do we even respect or understand the work of sectors different than our own? Within healthcare, and you know, I, I recently um, you know, had to go to uh, physical therapy um, because of uh, issues with my back. And it like worked wonders for me. Um, and I'm a well-educated, bless you, uh, physician and I, who had referred countless children to physical therapy over my lifetime. And I was actually surprised that it worked. <laughs> it's like, wow. That's really cool. That stuff actually works. <laughs> yeah. I thought, you know, I mean, they just, you know, they move your muscles around. They play with you a little while. You know, they make you forget you had back pain. And so, you know, you know, you know damn it. That stuff actually works. <laughs> yeah. I don't know crap about half the stuff in medicine and healthcare, let alone in social work or in community building, um, you know, and the work that is represented in this room. And, you know, I don't know whether or not uh, as a healthcare community, that we have been very good at respecting uh, some of that work. My time at the United Way as CEO there helped me to understand how challenging uh, these questions are just within a single service sector like the social service agencies. I went to United Way thinking that I was going to uh, really you know, whip them into shape um, and figure out how to coordinate all the hundreds, literally hundreds of organizations that we funded in Southeast Michigan. Not. Um, each one has their own board, each one has their own mission, each one has their own way that they're going to do stuff. And they're not going to change their mind simply because somebody says to. The dynamics across hospitals, physicians, nurses, social workers, community members, public health professionals, and lots of others is very challenging. So we, I don't know that we should even feel badly that we're not doing so great, except that now we do have to really tackle this more aggressively. A couple of examples here, and, and, and may not make, make, make much sense to you. Lady Limerick, and I'm running short on time. Lady Limerick uh, um, was, uh, did some studies in Ireland uh, when I was first uh, starting to look at SIDS. And the reason it was fascinating to me was because um, she uh, basically uh, proposed an intervention uh, to lower sudden infant death syndrome. And that was to send a visiting nurse to the house for the first five months, six months of life, and weigh the baby and measure the baby once a week for six months. And that's all she did. And talked to the family and whatever they wanted to talk about, she talked about it. No agenda other than that. And at the end of the time, uh, the incidence of sudden infant death syndrome had decreased significantly. People touching other people makes a difference. Home visitation, we know there's strong data to support nursing home visitation, and we keep saying that we cannot afford to pay for it. It's too expensive. We can't have health departments sending people out all over God's creation talking to people. It's a lot cheaper in the end run than what we are doing currently. Sister Friends, a program run at the Detroit Health Department and a national program, indeed an international program now, of matching a... Uh, older woman with a pregnant woman uh, through pregnancy and first year of life. I'm sorry, I used the word old again. Um, and I saw her you know, giving me the side eye there. Um, and uh, it um, is an intervention that provides social support. Um, and while we may not be able to measure what it means, uh, it can be an effective intervention. Make your date isn't just about uh, putting progesterone on a cervix. Um, it's also about um, bringing in the resources around and wrapping the arms around uh, that mother uh, and baby diet um, or soon to be baby diet so that um, they get what they need. Regional perinatal quality collaboratives are will be talked about later today and, and my aim certainly as well. But there's all kinds of things that you know, recognize in their very um, structure the importance of working together, uh, but we just haven't quite figured it out yet how to re make it really work and in, 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 in really be jazzed. 
uh, simply, and I'm not going to talk about this slide because uh, there's a presentation on it later, so I'll just skip over it. But I am uh, want to say that this uh, maternal infant strategy group started a few years ago and aligns uh, maternal and infant health professionals and goals across uh, lots of stakeholders. Um, and you can read it, but what I want to say about it is that I'm proud to be a member of this group and I'm hopeful for a number of reasons. Besides the needed emphasis on healthcare access and interventions and programs like Make Your Date, there is a recognition of the need to address openly, honestly, and transparently health equity and disparities. I am hopeful because there's been a genuine effort to engage communities across the state. I know that the issues in Petoskey are gonna be different than the issues in Detroit. Uh, I don't think racism is as big an issue in Petoskey as it is in Detroit, certainly, but every community has its issues and you need to understand what they are and work um, uh, with the data um, to uh, make the right decisions for your community. I'm on the Skillman Foundation board, and we had a joint meeting, or a meeting with um, Darren Ford, who is the uh, CEO of the Ford Foundation. Uh, and he um, talked about the difference between the work that foundations have done historically, to, is considered charitable work, and the difference between that and the work that the Ford Foundation has now committed itself to, and that is justice. I don't care if you love me, I don't care if you think that I need help and you're gonna provide it for me. Um, I don't care about that. What I care about is that people all deserve the same thing. Um, they need equal access to healthcare. They need to be treated uh, respectfully. I implore each and every one of us to commit to reflect upon our implicit biases that we all have. And I ask you to consider how you might work more effectively with others to perhaps think outside of the boxes that we tend to place ourselves in I encourage us all to remember that poor, vulnerable, underserved, at-risk people are not any different from us. Let us devote ourselves to the recognition that those we serve don't need our pity or paternalistic or maternalistic care. They need to be treated with dignity, with respect, as we would want for our own loved ones. I was going to uh, have, uh, I have a little recording of Maya Angelou and I'm not gonna play it now uh, because we have something, believe it or not, more important than Herman Gray. And that is, I have the distinct privilege and honor uh, to introduce um, uh, to you all uh, the governor of our great state of Michigan. A lifelong Michigander, uh, Governor Whitmer grew up in Grand Rapids and East Lansing. Uh, as the daughter of a Frank Kelly Democrat and a Bill Milliken Republican, those are pretty good genes. Her parents instilled in her and her siblings a strong work ethic and the strong belief, uh, deep belief, that everyone is important. She started her first job at age 15 at Burlingame Lumber and later worked the line at the Royal Fork Buffet and stock shelves at Target. After her time in Grand Rapids, Governor Whitmer attended Michigan State University and the MSU College of Law. After graduating, she stayed in the Lansing area where she spent her 14 years in the Michigan legislature on the front lines fighting for hardworking Michigan families. As Senate Democratic leader, Governor Whitmer worked across the aisle to expand health care coverage to more than 680,000 people through Healthy Michigan. Many of us in this room know just how powerful and transformative that was for this state. As governor, she's committed to solving problems for Michiganders across the state. Under her leadership, that means expanding access to affordable health care, improving education and skills training, respecting working families, cleaning up Michigan's drinking water, and of course, fixing the damn roads. <laughs> there has never been a, a campaign slogan that has resonated with me as much as that one. 
And I don't know if that's a commentary on politics or potholes, um, and perhaps even both. Uh, but please join me in giving a warm Michigan welcome to Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Thank you. Whoa. All right. Good afternoon. I'm so pleased to be with all of you today, and I got here a little bit early so I could sit in the back and listen to Dr. Gray. And I know we could have listened to him quite a bit longer because the subject matter that he is an expert on is something that a lot of people in this room are passionate about. I know that people don't go into this line of work because you're going to be on the front page of the paper, because you're going to get the biggest paychecks. This is a passion. This is incredibly important work that you do. You save lives. People who get the front line, front, you know, the headlines, they're not on the front lines like you are. And I want to thank you for the work that you do. This is an incredibly important thing that we all have to tackle together. I want to thank Amy Zagman for inviting me and the Maternal Infant Strategy Group and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services for the important work that is being done every day and recognizing how much more we have to do. We've taken some important steps, to be sure, to improve access to health care. The Healthy Michigan Plan, which Dr. Gray mentioned in my introduction, uh, was such an important step for us to take as a state. And we did it together. It wasn't one party or the other. It was us actually working together, showing that divided government doesn't have to look like Washington, D.C., right? We solved a problem in taking this major step forward to get 680,000 people covered in the state of Michigan. And unfortunately, a step was taken backward when it came to changing that law and creating work requirements. But my new head of DHHS and I are working to mitigate the harm that was done in those work requirements to ensure that we, yes, promote work. That's a good goal. But we also must preserve health care in the process. That's the goal that we all share in this room. Michigan joined the Alliance for Innovation and Maternal Health in 2015 to prevent and reduce maternal mortality. And in 2016, hospitals providing maternity care in Michigan started implementing hemorrhage and hypertension safety bundles that have proven to improve maternal health outcomes and reduce maternal morbidity at the hospital and state level. And it's so important that our state continues to move forward, helping new moms and babies lead healthy lives. Because right now, moms and babies are dying preventable deaths. The US has the highest maternal death rate in the developed world. And as Dr. Gray so aptly pointed out, there are racial components to this that are undeniable. The Detroit maternal health rate is three times that of the national average. And of the pregnancy-related deaths in Michigan from 2011 to 2015, 44% were determined to be preventable. 44%. We need to start working to raise Michigan from being one of the worst states in infant and maternal health outcomes to one of the best. We need to make sure that expecting moms everywhere have the care that they need to ensure a healthy pregnancy. And acknowledge and address the true health disparities in Michigan by ensuring that our most marginalized communities have access to health care, quality health care. Because right now we know that African American women are three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than white women. And in 2017, babies born to African-American women were more than twice as likely to die before their first birthday than babies who are born to white women. If we want to get to work lowering Michigan's infant mortality rate, we've got to make sure that all women have access to quality care. And we can also get to work reducing preventable infant deaths and ultimately reaching zero, which is the goal, 
by addressing the primary causes of infant mortality so we can ensure that women have the support they need after giving birth. That means ensuring paid sick leave for new moms. Yes? It also means making sure that new moms can get educated on things that are as pervasive like postpartum depression. I'm working with the Department of Health and Human Services to develop a statewide health plan that has the goal of zero preventable deaths and zero health disparities. It's a plan that's been developed by the community, with the community, and for the community. We've gotten input from town hall meetings to families in our communities and local organizations. And this plan will help because we'll be focusing on keeping expecting moms healthy to keep their babies healthy too. And that means helping expecting moms plan for their pregnancy and stay healthy throughout it. Acknowledging and addressing health disparities in Michigan by our most marginalized communities who, and ensuring all have access to care. We know that we've got an incredible amount of work to do ahead of us. But here's what else I know, having spent the last two years traveling our state, talking to people in their homes, in their communities, in coffee shops, on the street, listening more than I'm talking because my mom told me you have two ears and one mouth for a reason. You should listen twice as much as you talk. I know that the people of Michigan are good people who work hard, who simply want opportunity, a level playing field to get ahead, that starts with the most basic and fundamental rights and care for moms and for our babies. This is the thing that we can do better that will actually improve lives in this state. That is why the, DA, the Department of Health and Human Services, this organization, we are working collaboratively to address these problems. Because I wanna be able to say at the end of my four years in this term as governor, that we've made a difference, that we've helped moms and kids across the state, that there are more of them because of the work we did to prevent deaths that were unnecessary. We are going to make a big difference in Michigan. It starts not just with fixing the damn roads, thank you, Dr. Gray, <laughs> but it continues with ensuring that every dollar in that state budget is going where it is needed most that we stop robbing important things like the education of our kids, the health care of our people to fill potholes. When we do it the right way, we can make Michigan a top 10 state, whether it is in pre preventing deaths of moms and babies, educating our kids, ensuring everyone has clean drinking water when they turn on the faucet, closing the skills gap, or even fixing the roads. This is our opportunity and it is our responsibility. This is a great state. We have serious challenges, but the best news of all is the people of Michigan have grit and we are up to this challenge. And with you by my side, I know we're gonna be successful. Thank you so much for the work that you do and thank you for letting me be a part of your, your organization and the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Whitmer. It's really uh, great to have a leader that, uh, even if you don't agree with uh, her politics, to support the issues that are important to the people in this room, uh, for women to have access to high quality health care, uh, to uh, train uh, the people of Michigan uh, uh, to uh, be able to uh, have more productive jobs and to live uh, uh, happier and more uh, uh, rewarding lives. Uh, and uh, certainly it's folks like us who will work hand in hand with 
our governor and the department in particularly to um, improve the health outcomes of babies and uh, their, uh, uh, their moms. So um, I think this is a first for Herman Gray in that um, I had my talk interrupted uh, by a governor. Um, I suppose the next uh, opportunity will be a president or a prime minister, I'm not sure. I'm sort of hoping for Italy. Um, yeah, red wine and pasta are you know, part of my favorite things. Um, and if you just give me a moment, um, since we do have a couple minutes, um, I forgot and left all my stuff in my chair. You know, we sort of ended on a um, challenging note. Um, you know, I know that uh, talking about racism is, is a heavy, uh, heavy subject, uh, and perhaps particularly so for lunch. Um, and I appreciate your attention and kindness. Um, and I just want to uh, remind us of something I said a little bit earlier, which everyone in this room knows, but it's good to be reminded of it often, and that is, is that genetically and biologically we are all the same. Um, and that this is something, uh, America's original sin is something that we can work our way through um, if we are willing, and, uh, willing to commit to that. Um, and so I thought it appropriate that um, uh, you hear this if it actually works. Uh, otherwise, and it, of course it doesn't, um, uh, but um, I will read it. Human family. I note the obvious differences in the human family. Some of us are serious. Some thrive on comedy. Some declare their lives are lived as true profundity, and others claim they really live the real reality. The variety of our skin tones can confuse, bemuse, delight, brown and pink and beige and purple, tan and blue and white. I've sailed upon the seven seas and stopped in every land. I've seen the wonders of the world, not yet one common man. I know 10,000 women called Jane and Mary Jane, but I've not seen any two who really were the same. Mirror twins are different, although their features jibe and lovers think quite different thoughts while lying side by side. We love and lose in China. We weep on England's moors and laugh and moan in Guinea and thrive on Spanish shores. We seek success in Finland, are born and die in Maine. In minor ways we differ, in major we're the same. I note the obvious differences between each sort and type, but we are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. We are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. We are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. Together, we can create a better world for our mothers, our babies, and our families. So with that, go out and go get them. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>